So switch it to English. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, with us Professor Jorge Zubelli. Uh, Professor Zubelli has been uh, uh, in, the, in the mathematical com the mathematical community for a long time in Brazil. He has been responsible for the uh, create perhaps not the creation, but uh, the, the, a lot of the development on the mathematical finance course at, at IMPA. He's also the the leader of the uh, Lanka Lab. Uh, and it was the, uh, the creator of the lab as well. Uh, so George has a long story. He has uh, is a, a engineer by uh, IMI, Instituto Militar de Engenharia. He then went to did an MSc at IMPA and eventually got his PhD by Berkeley uh, under the supervision of uh, George Grumbau, if I could know correctly. Alberto Grumbau. And, uh, Alberto Grumbau, I'm sorry. And... Uh, he has uh, traveled around the world quite a lot, and he is now the chair of the uh, chair of mathematics in the Khalifa University uh, at Abu Dhabi. So, uh, so today he's going to talk to us about one of his main favorite teams, teams that is the calibration of temp diffusion models. And so, thank you very much for having uh, accepted our invitation, George. The stage is all yours. Okay. Well. Let me thank Max and uh, Juan Limaco for the invitation. Max de Souza is a longtime friend and collaborator, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk to you. It's a long way. I'd like to acknowledge also the presence of my friend, Professor Luis Adalto da Justa Medeiros, uh, whom I have uh, uh, met many years ago when I was still uh, an undergraduate student in uh, IMI. So my topic today is a topic that's very close to my heart. It's a calibration of uh, models in finance. And uh, as some of you may know, I started working in finance about uh, 10 to 15 years ago. And um, coming from the background of analysis and uh, inverse problems, I uh, quickly realized that there was a lot to be done in the field of uh, inverse problems in finance. It was extremely important. So I decided, OK, let me try my best in what I know how to do and see what kind of interesting problems we can find. And I think that's a paradigm for the way that mathematicians, applied mathematicians, should work. I mean, you should uh, try to identify the problems where you can make a contribution uh, in the different areas. So um, the basic outline for my talk is this introduction, which I'm going through right now. Then I'm going to, in the tradition of inverse problems, first talk and bore you with the direct problem, and then discuss the inverse problem go through some numerical examples and some final considerations. I must say that this is joint work with uh, Vinicius Albany, my former PhD student, now professor at the Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, and uh, also now a very good friend of mine and collaborator. Um, so the beginning of the story is uh, related to two Nobel laureates, uh, Robert Merton and Myron Scholes. Uh, Myron Scholes and uh, Robert Merton got the Nobel Prize back in 97 for their work jointly with uh, Fisher Black on the subject of the so-called Black-Scholes-Merton equation, which is a partial differential equation that I'm going to describe right now. Uh, the partial differential equation is for the function p, which depends on t, time, and x, the spot value, spot price. This is a final value problem, okay? And it's a, a no um, uh, linear differential equation. There is, I just spotted a small typo here. There is a plus between the second derivative with respect to x and the r. So it's, it's uh, 
I'm going to read the equation and then identify the different terms here. So, as I said, P is the price, is the price of an, an instrument called an option. I don't have time to go into detail of what uh, an option is, but believe me, it's a fundamental object in financial markets nowadays, and it's been like that for a good 30 to 40 years, and especially after the work of Black and Scholes, this became extremely popular. So back to the, the equation, it's the partial derivative of the price with respect to time, plus one half of sigma square, where sigma in principle in this very first slide, but only here is going to be constant, x square, second derivative of p with respect to x, plus, and this is the typo that's missing here, r, x dp dx minus p equals zero. And as I said, this is a final value problem. This is being solved for time before the expiration time with a given h, which is the so-called payoff of the option. So basically someone goes to the market and gives uh, or creates a financial instrument that's going to expire at a certain time, TE. And at this time, TE, which is the expiration time, then we have a given payoff, something that's usually suited to some financial transactions. And the question that comes naturally is, what is the price of this financial instrument at an earlier time, at a time that's before TE, okay? And uh, it turns out that these uh, three individuals, we have two here, but uh, Fisher Black was um, a third collaborator in this work, and that's why we call it the black shows metal equation. And uh, so uh, the question is, what is the price of this option before uh, the expiration, okay? Well, um, so the first thing that appears in this equation, and let me identify the different objects. As I said, this is a partial differential equation of parabolic type. It's a, a final value problem. So it's with plus, which is the correct sign. Usually when we study PDEs and we teach PDEs to the students and we teach uh, parabolic equations, we usually put uh, the minus sign here because we teach initial value problems, but we are solving a final value problem here. Therefore, we have a plus. And, uh, and uh, with the, the sigma here being the diffusion uh, coefficient in the terminology of physics, in the terminology of finance, this is the uh, volatility. Now, what is the volatility? And okay, before I go to that, let me actually mention what is the other parameter that's appearing here. We have R, that's the interest rate. Uh, in fact, you can uh, these days almost neglect the value of R for the practical purposes because R is very low. But yet, the volatility is something that you cannot neglect. Um, the volatility in the original model of Black and Scholes was considered to be constant. And the volatility, as I was going to say, and is the agitation of the market. So how much the financial market is agitated. So in periods when the market is like business as usual, the volatility tends to be low. However, if uh, there is a shock, if there is something bad happening, for example, uh, this week we had the um, COVID um, positiveness of um, Mr. Trump, and uh, that agitated the market tremendously. So every time there is something different appearing, um, which impacts the market, the volatility tends to change. However, in the original model that Black, Scholes, and Merton proposed, the volatility was supposed to be constant, and um, this had advantages as a model, it was simple. It was, in fact, uh, an easy ex it is an, ex an exercise for the students, an easy exercise to the students to just transform the equation we have there into a 
heat equation by a change of variables given that sigma and r is constant. So it's fun to do that and it's usually done in elementary courses in finance. However, however, as I was saying, uh, the volatility doesn't have any reason to be constant. In fact, um, I'd like to show you this graph uh, of the Bovespa index, this very important index that we have in Brazil. And uh, in red, you see the index, okay, going up and down with the usual way. And you can look at the time series of this index and you can ask what's the volatility along a ruling, uh, sorry, a running uh, window, okay? So a running window that uh, would uh, span this, um, this uh, time period from 1999 all the way to 2004 um, gives us a way of computing the volatility. And in the black curve that you see here, you see the volatility that I've been talking about. And you can see in this curve that the volatility has no reason to be assumed to be constant. Yet, yet, when Black and Scholes came with their model, it was the uh, assumption, which was a working assumption to make things simple and to make things treatable. Well, so this talk is actually about the concern that the volatility is not constant. Therefore, the uh, equation that we have here with constant coefficient becomes an equation that's uh, much more complicated. It has to be solved by numerical methods, usually. And uh, therefore, uh, the question is how can we um, calibrate the volatility from market prices. Please note that when we, log, we talk about volatility, actually there are lots of different interpretations and meanings for, for uh, volatility. So typically in econometrics, we talk about the historical volatility. And when I put the graph of the Bovespa concerning the volatility, I immediately said, consider a running window and compute the volatility along that window. But there are lots of ways of computing it using different uh, models, for example, Garch models and so, and so on and so forth. Those are usually referred to as uh, econometric models. There is also the concept of implied or implicit volatility, which comes from the black shows formula. And this is going to come up again in this talk. And there are lots of stochastic models. In particular, there are the stochastic volatility models that um, uh, have been studied by George Papanicolaou, Jean-Pierre Fouque and others. In fact, I had the pleasure of collaborating with Max de Souza on this topic of stochastic volatility models. Now, in this talk, I'm going to be concerned about what we call the local volatility. And the local volatility is actually a non-parametric model in the sense of statistics. And um, I also like to call your attention to uh, stochastic local volatility models. This is work that I did with uh, Saporito and Young um, that was published uh, a few, I think a couple of years ago in computers and mathematics with applications. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on the local volatility in the presence of jumps, okay? And this is um, what I'm going to discuss now. So what is, um, first of all, the take home message from uh, this talk? And I'd like to say that because there's a lot to cover in this talk. And usually by the end of the talk, um, the attention span is naturally going to slow down. Um, I've been teaching a lot online these days and I know that uh, paying attention to a lecture online is sometimes way more um, difficult and challenging than paying attention to a lecture when you are there physically. So what's the take home message? We have considered the simultaneous calibration of the local volatility and the jump size distribution in the model. I'm going to define those terms precisely. 
we have stated the regularity properties of the parameter to solution map. This is what we call the direct problem. This, um, the differential equation is actually an integral differential equation in the presence of jumps. So you have to discuss a little bit existence, uniqueness and regularity properties of the problem in order to even consider the inverse problem. We have also then after studying the direct problem, consider the Tikhonov regularization of the inverse problem. And we actually use it to solve separately for the local volatility and for the jump size distribution. And then we use what we call the splitting technology or splitting strategy, where we solve the inverse problem first in the volatility, then in the jump size, then from that, sorry, from the local volatility, we, we solve for the jump size, from the jump size, we solve for the local volatility, and we iterate on that. And the question is, of course, is this going to converge or is it going to give some regularized solution? And uh, the answer basically coming from the theory is that yes, we get a, a theoretical as well as good numerical algorithm. Uh, the work that I'm describing here, again, for those who have arrived later, um, is joined with uh, Vinicius Albany in, uh, in this, uh, it was just published in Finance and Stochastics, and it's also available in the archive if you want to take a look there, okay? So, basic starting point. The starting point is a very important paper by, by uh, Bruno Dupier from um, France. Bruno is a very influential uh, quantitative finance person and uh, has come up with very important contributions to finance. And in particular, he notes the importance of um, uh, taking into account the time and the value of the underlying price in the model. And uh, he proposed a model which is now called the Dupier local volatility model. And uh, from the mathematical point of view, uh, it consists basically in assuming that sigma is a function of time and the underlying. And uh, therefore, the Black-Scholes equation becomes a, an equation with non-constant coefficients and um, the sigma that's appearing here becomes then a function of time and x, okay? And from now on, the payoff that I'm going to consider is the payoff or the function h, which is the so-called call option, okay? We could also do everything for the put option, it's very little change, okay? And um, in this case, um, this is the equation, and uh, one problem that I have studied um, with my former students, I'm going to quote this work, is how to calibrate this equation based on the prices that are quoted from the market. And it's an important remark that the prices that are quoted in the market don't necessarily correspond to the historical or econometric volatility that you see in the historical series. And the basic reason for that, well, there are lots of financial reasons for that, but the financial, the main uh, important thing is that Black and Scholes somehow lives in a risk neutral world where market uh, agents are somehow competing and uh, um, trading so that they form the prices and the equation itself is going to take that into consideration in the model, okay? So, uh, in Dupier's equation, uh, it's uh, traditional to, oh sorry, I didn't say that, but the Black-Scholes equation that you see here has as variables time and the price. Now, when you take h as x minus k, 
then the solution becomes function of two extra parameters, the parameters being the time to expiration and the strike price. So now we have time, real time, physical time, we have the original price, which is X, and we have these extra parameters, which are kind of dual parameters, the expiration time and the option strike price, which we call K. So Lupir, in another very important contribution, notes something very important, that it's natural to also consider P as a function of T, capital T, and K. And therefore, ask which equation does P satisfy? Well, he came up with the answer to that. So the answer to that is basically the following. If we define the auxiliary variable U as time, as function of time and function of K, then this auxiliary function satisfies an initial value problem, which is of the type that we all love and like when we study um, heat equation or diffusive equations. And um, now the initial condition at time t equals zero is x minus k, and the equation is appearing with the sigma square as a function of t and k. The reason to do that is not only for the beauty of putting it in the traditional way, but also because in practice, what happens is we are at a fixed time t for a fixed price x, and we are looking forward at different expiration times and different strike prices, and therefore, we expect to see this volatility surface in the future as our um, uh, variable of interest or uh, as our surface of interest. So now we are studying this volatility surface, which somehow uh, from the economical point of view tells us what market view, how, how the market views the uh, volatility that's going to come up in the future, okay? Um, by the way, uh, feel free to interrupt. I don't know how this can work out in uh, such a very uh, broad uh, audience, but hopefully if, if there is any question or anything, please feel free to ask me, okay? Well, so uh, what is the problem then from the point of view of calibration? Now I, I put to you the forward problem and the forward problem is this problem here, equation three, it's a direct problem that I'm considering. And uh, the question is now, suppose the market comes up with loss of prices. In other words, with lots of values for U, is it possible to compute or at least to approximate sigma to mimic those prices? And if so, how much error am I making? So those are the natural questions that when you look at inverse problems, you would be considering, okay? So given a set of uh, observed prices, these observed prices um, are given from the market and they are going to be for a fixed T and a fixed X, but for different strike prices and expiration times, capital T and K, find what is the best fit for such market price. From the mathematical point of view, it's a classical inverse problem. However, we are in the situation where we have noise, so we have to consider noisy data, and therefore, as traditional in this field, we are going to consider U delta, which is the perturbation of U by a certain amount of noise coming from the measurements, coming from B-desk spread, coming from uh, truncation coming from discretization of the value, so it can come from many sources, okay? And of course, from model error, because our model doesn't, be, doesn't need to be perfect. So we expect that this is going to be a very noisy data. And 
as traditional in this field, we consider a parameter to solution operator. In other words, what's the parameter? Our parameter is sigma, uh, and our solution is going to be u, and um, our parameter uh, actually is going to be sigma squared, just for the record, and I shall call that a, so a is one half of sigma squared, and uh, so I send a given um, square of the volatility, which is usually called the variance, and one half of that just for uh, convenience. So I send my A, which is an element of this uh, Sobolev space H1 plus epsilon, defined in the domain that I'm considering, which is unbounded domain, by the way, into L2 of omega, which is the space where the solutions in principle are going to lie. They're actually going to be in nicer space, spaces because, you know, we have, we're solving a diffusion, a diffusive equation, but, but we are going to consider in L2 just because that's how we measure error in the image of our operator, okay? Well, so we have this parameter to solution operator, and based on this parameter to solution operator, I'm going to solve and analyze the inverse problem. So the inverse problem is going to be set in this setup of Tikhonov regularization, um, where we look at the mismatch between the value of our computer solution and the observed U delta. This mismatch is going to be computed in the L2 norm. And then we add to that a regularization functional which is going to be a function f, which incorporates the a priori information that we have on the function a, okay? From the statistical point of view, there is a very um, important interpretation of that in terms of Bayesian statistics. I'm not going to go into that, but uh, it's, a, it's a Bayesian approach. So there is actually a dictionary between Tikhonov regularization and Bayesian statistics, and we are somehow solving a uh, likelihood estimate problem here, okay? I can go into that in the discussion afterwards. Okay, so questions, natural questions. Does there exist a minimizer of the regularized problem? And suppose that the noise level goes to zero, how fast does the regularized solution go to the true solution? This actually have been analyzed in a joint paper with um, a former student, Adriano de Cesaro and uh, Otma Schetzer. It was published in the Journal of Nonlinear Analysis, now back in 12, 2012, okay? And there are other questions that are very relevant for uh, practical applications. Can we devise an iterative algorithm? Does the algorithm converge? Can we regularize this by, by stopping the iteration judiciously? Well, all these are answered in a series of works that I had the pleasure of working with Adriano de Cesaro and with uh, Vinicius Albany. And in fact, we proved a technical condition that ensures the convergence of the iteration. We also obtained a criterion for stopping and uh, we obtained a regularization by discretization uh, technique, okay? And furthermore, we implemented all these algorithms numerically. We also compared with other methods such as Kalman filters and uh, other ones, okay? And uh, just to give you a flavor of what kind of um, solutions we get, we can get then for different prices, for example, for prices that are traded in the market, WTI, crude oil is something that's very important for uh, financial markets. WTI is a type of oil. So for these, uh, we got this type of uh, curves. We also did extensive experiments. I'm not going to go into that because I want to focus today in this problem, which concerns the jump diffusion problem. 
So let me go back to direct, the direct problem. But before even discussing the direct problem, what I need to do is set up the um, evolution of the stock price under this model. So in this situation, we are talking about a filtered probability space and the stock market or the stock price that's negotiated in the market is assumed to satisfy a jump diffusion process. So this is the first part in this first line here is the usual um, diffusion model from finance. And the second part here is the jump uh, process part. And uh, this model has been uh, very, very uh, much studied. It's a very realistic model and it goes well beyond the Black and Scholes model, although it makes life much harder. It makes life harder first because by the time you look at this model, your Black and Scholes equation is not an, a differential equation anymore. It becomes a, an integral differential equation. And in fact, uh, it's, um, and I'm not going to even to write this equation, I'm going to go ahead and speak directly about the call prices and observe that there is a generalization of the Pierce formula, which I talked about a few slides ago, which is again very much like uh, the du Pierce equation, that's the left hand side that you are seeing here in the equation seven, with a right hand side, which is a forcing term coming from the jump diffusion process. By the way, this is very deep work uh, uh, done, developed by Amel Bentata, who was actually a uh, a visitor at IMPA a few years ago and Ramakont, a very good friend of mine, and both of them uh, developed this um, generalization of the Pierce formula. It's a substantial piece of work published in finance and stochastics. And without that, we couldn't have done what we did because our approach depends heavily on the Pierce formula in the same way as our regularization also depended on the Pierce formula. So, uh, we consider this a generalization of the Pierce formula, and um, we first have to analyze the well posedness of the problem, which we did, and we did all these technical parts, which I'm not going to go into. We then perform a change of variables in the same way and following the same lines of what we had done before for the local volatility models. So you see here on the left hand side of the equation, a parabolic type of equation. Uh, however, it's not exactly like the heat equation with non-constant coefficients. There is a transport term that never goes away. And thanks to this transport term, lots of extra things could be done, which were not possible in the case of the heat equation by itself. Fortunately, somehow finance and the world of finance has this different uh, behavior. And on the right hand side, you see the integral part of the problem. Okay. And we have here as unknown, as unknowns, as unknown functional parameters to our model, the A, which is the diffusion coefficient, and the new, which is the jump size distribution. By the way, we are using the two-sided jump size distribution. This is uh, uh, important in our approach, makes life much easier. It allows us to, to work uh, much more freely on the whole real line instead of only the uh, part of the real line, okay? Well, so we consider uh, then um, this double exponential tail of uh, new, and uh, it's defined according to this um, uh, equation that you see here. And we rewrite this uh, right-hand side of the operator as something that actually is very convenient. It's a kind of convolution between the double exponential tail and the uh, diffusive part of the equation that appeared 
uh, on this uh, left-hand side of the equation, okay? So with that, we set up the problem. We have to make assumptions, of course, in this uh, inverse problems, you always have to make assumptions about the basic model. In particular, we are going to assume that our phi on the left-hand side become, belongs to W21 of minus infinity zero. On the right-hand side, it also become, belongs to W21 of zero infinity. We consider then our problem in the product space of the diffusion part, which is H1 plus epsilon, as before, if you remember, and these uh, two-sided uh, uh, contributions, okay? So this is our domain of the parameters we are going to try to invert for, and uh, one part that has to do with the diffusion, the H1 plus epsilon, the other part that has to do with jumps, okay? We put some upper and lower bounds in our diffusion. These are imp This is important both from the physical or economical point of view as well as from the mathematical point of view. And <clears throat> we consider this phi broken in the phi minus and phi plus part, okay? So with that, we have our first proposition, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we let a phi be in this domain. We assume that phi is bounded, okay, in L1 of the domain. And uh, then there is a unique solution of the partial integral differential equation problem in W12 log, okay? Well, so that's defined, this defines the parameter to solution map. And from this parameter to solution map, now we look at the regularization of the problem. Um, we prove that F is continuous. It's weakly continuous and compact. It's actually Frechet differentiable. And you even have bounds about the continuity modules of this differentiability, okay? So we have a very strong grip of what are the properties of our parameter to solution map. And we are ready to go for the inverse problem technology here. So we then start off from a surface of European option prices, which is parameterized by the time to expiration and the log uh, moneyness, which is the log of the price, basically. We assume that this is a solution of some problem. And uh, then we look at this corresponding um, inverse problem, assuming we have some scarce noise, noisy data and um, with a certain given noise level. We perform the Tikhonov regularization. So we basically consider the functional which is now in a LP norm in this space, which we call Y, the, the underlying space that um, we are considering for the, uh, for the solutions, for the measurements, okay? And uh, we consider a perturbation of this by alpha, which is the regularization parameter and the regularization function. So the setup is extremely general. It's a natural setup for um, optimization. It has been studied by many people. Um, and um, we have some technical assumptions that unfortunately due to the time I'm going to skip, but this is uh, related to deep work that has been developed by um, um, Otmar Scherz and collaborators back in 2008, where they have studied the setup of this problem in detail, and they have put assumptions so that the inverse problem, in fact, has solutions and has all kinds of nice behavior. And as a result, under those assumptions, we can actually devise a way of choosing the regularization parameter uh, in such a way that uh, we have uh, a well-posed problem, okay? And uh, 
in that way, we can actually construct penalty terms. The penalty terms, for example, could be the callback libel diversions that appears a lot these days in different applications. By the way, this is, uh, you have to take my word for that, it's related to many topics that are very popular these days, in particular with machine learning and other subjects, okay? And uh, in this context, we have um, uh, assumptions here that uh, these uh, functionals are convex, weakly continuous and coercive. For example, this is satisfied by the Kobach libel divergence. Okay. And we also have uh, ways of bounding these things in an appropriate way. Uh, this work for the theoretical part has been developed by Resmerit and Anderson, a very interesting paper, and we are really using um, their results here in this part, okay? So what's the splitting strategy now? The splitting strategy is basically to have two projections, projection in the A part, which is the volatility part or the variance part, and projection on the jump part, and we apply this recursively. We solve for one problem, we solve for the other, and we iterate, minimizing in both domains um, um, iteratively, okay? And so by that, we get a sequence phi n and a n, which are uh, minimizers of our problem, fixing one at a time and solving for the different uh, minimizers, okay? And uh, we get to a stationary point of this functional. And uh, in, in fact, we can show that for every initializing pair and any conversion subsequence produced by the splitting algorithm, it converges to some stationary point of F. And this is stable to the perturbation. So the approach that we propose here is to take that as our solution to the inverse problem. It's a regularized solution. It's a solution in a generalized sense, no question about that, in the same way as a weak solution to a PDE is a solution to a PDE in that sense. So, in fact, we can uh, show that there is a stopping criteria and we also have propositions concerning to the iterative uh, solution, okay? And how fast the uh, error of our solution uh, converges as the noise level converges to zero, okay? So, to, um, and these are details that we, I'm not going to have time to go into now, I'm really running out of time, but um, I want to kind of close by some showing some numeric examples to give you a flavor of what's going on. So we solve the PDE by the Crank-Nicholson scheme and um, we use minimization of Tikhonov type uh, L2 and this is solved by gradient descent method and uh, we stop the iterations when we reach a certain relative error with respect to the tolerance. It's usually 1%, okay, in the numerical experience that we did. And uh, so by using synthetic data, we can compare the so-called uh, local volatility that we get with the true results. And in red here, we have uh, data, in other words, um, the results that we get and the, the sorry, the points uh, in the data. And in blue, what we see is a calibrated result, okay? So you see that the adherence to the volatility uh, is very good. This is synthetic experience. So you see already some difference, which is natural. It's a new post problem and you're going to always have this mismatch, okay? Um, we can look at the implied volatility, which is something that's very important for financial analysts. 
you can see that in the data points that we considered, which were the data points that were used as our measurements, the implied volatility matches extremely well. And this is in the presence of noise. And um, so the model is actually fitting very well. And we, the, in the synthetic experiment, experiment, we also get a good agreement with the, uh, the jumping part, although you see here some differences. So, for example, in red, on the right-hand side, you see some mismatch between our synthetic example and the true solution, okay? Yet, uh, it's very good on the left and on the right, okay? And uh, here's the local volatility surface that we get. On the left-hand side, I have the true sol solution. On the right-hand side, I have the one step and two steps uh, into the algorithm, okay? Uh, again, let me show you the results of synthetic data. And believe me, it's very, very hard for people from market data to adjust the jump size diffusion as we are doing here, okay? Now, we did it, of course, with real data. And uh, here are the results that we get from real data. For example, for tax options, these are the implied volatility, sorry, the, the local volatility surface and the double exponential tail and the jump size density, okay? And here you see the uh, fitting with the so-called implied volatility. This is a way of uh, making sure that our results are adherent to the market. And you see a very good fit in the uh, implied volatility that our algorithm obtains, which is the blue line and the data points that we see in the market, okay? And these are slices for different time moments. So let me do my final considerations. We have considered this problem of the simultaneous calibration of the local volatility and the jump size distribution. We have obtained regularity properties of the parameter to solution map. We have performed the Tikhonov regularization to solve the inverse problem separately. And we have applied this splitting strategy to solve the problem. We had numerical examples and we also had examples with real data. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. And let me make some final propaganda. We are going to have this year the researching options in virtual mode. So if you like, uh, virtual lectures and uh, please join us for research and options. Please check this up at the page of IMPA where the data, the information about the uh, registration and so on is given, okay? So hope to see you there. Thank you so much. And I finalize with some uh, references that we have used. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much for a very nice talk, and uh, thank you also thank for you. being well, so much in time. Well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, questions? Comments? Max, up to you so, to ask questions. Yes. So, I have, <laughs> a, a, I have a perverse question, actually. Perverse so, questions. Yeah. I love perversity these days. It's perverse. Perversity is, uh, is probably new. Okay, so suppose that has been quite has been perverse and give you some data, some synthetic data generated with a Stockwell model. What would you inverse problem would come out with? I mean, have you have an idea how this uh, the um, inverse problem would react to Stockwell data? Okay, okay, good, good question. Um, we didn't do this for the jump diffusion models. Okay, but uh, Vinicius and I actually worked out this for the local volatility models in the case of this so-called Heston model, which is perhaps the baby example of the um, 
of the of stochastic volatility model okay so the simplest stochastic volatility model that you can come up with is so-called Heston and in fact what we did was a very very interesting experiment we solved it Heston model forward we got our solution beautifully and very well approximated then we forgot that we had Heston we took that as data like measurements from the market and ask ourselves what is the corresponding local volatility and we actually get a very nice local volatility we showed this actually to some financial analysts people who are working in the market they said oh yeah yeah it, it, it makes sense i mean it has some 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 fitting now in this case um I, we never did the experiment. It might be an interesting thing to consider. And uh, I may, um, yeah, so perhaps uh, Vinicius, I don't know if Vinicius is there, but uh, we, uh, I may discuss this with Vinicius and see what we can do about that. The, the answer is I don't know uh, precisely, but it's, it's an important thing sometimes to see how one model would, what kind of data or what kind of solution it gives you to uh, the inverse problem when you solve from a different uh, model. And, uh, and perhaps even look at it at perturbative models. And this is actually a, a good application for this uh, theory and it's good application because of the following because you can solve this stochastic volatility models that you are talking about max in a very yeah. precise way with extreme degree of accuracy and from there you can back up and uh, and get the local volatility surface for that okay, okay. thank you so uh any 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 further questions any more questions well mm -hmm. i may ask you a second question if nobody wants to ask another question i think there is yeah. a question but there is mute uh, mauro rincon you are oh, muted oh. Oi, oi, oi. Oi, olá. É... É, é, o, o maior problema da do, do, equação de Black Scholes é, é usar a, 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 volatilidade, a, a volatilidade constante. Exato. É, né? Agora, a, a, a equação de Black Scholes ainda é, me parece que é usada ainda no mercado financeiro com os limites no mercado de opções. É, você sabe disso? Você sabe se é verdade? Então, então é, é, como eu falei no início, ela, ela é usada, sim, para é, fazer o cálculo da volatilidade implícita, que é essa volatilidade que eu usei como comparação. Mas, na prática, o mercado dificilmente, bancos vão fazer precificação Sim, é, com o Black and Shows é, clássico, isso, isso causa um montão de problemas e uma das razões pelas quais isso causa problemas é o efeito é, de smile, essa volatilidade implícita, ela se torna, é, deveria ser constante e, e tem essa forma é, de o que a gente viu constantemente nos meus gráficos, por exemplo, nesse gráfico aqui que a gente vê é, esses dados aqui são dados de mercado se fosse Sim. verdade que Black and Shows funcionava você não ia ver essa variação de jeito nenhum você ia ver uma constante aqui em Sim. todos esses gráficos porque você está resolvendo o problema inverso de Black and Shows para um modelo que teoricamente devia dar volatilidade constante mas essa não é a realidade, é, isso que é, é esse o grande problema aqui, é por isso que a gente é, é, tenta fazer esses modelos bem mais sofisticados. Né? Ok, obrigado, obrigado. Jorge. Nada, prazer. Prazer. Bom, a gente manda para o português, talvez mais, mais, okay, mais alguma uhum. pergunta? <risos> Então, eu vou fazer uma pergunta em português, Jorge. Por Você favor. Você mencionou aquelas, aquelas conexões do, do Quebec Liber com o Machine Learning. 
Você uhum. não, quer, não quer expandir um pouco esse teu comentário, não? É, 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 um, é um, foi provocatório, foi provocatório. Eu sabia que, que é o que está acontecendo atualmente é, é uma tendência de é, a, realmente se movimentar na direção de data-driven models, model, modelos que são uhum. é, direcionados e dominados pela pelos dados. Nesse sentido, as pessoas usam cada vez mais modelos que são extremamente é, não paramétricos e que, por sua vez, é, desenvolvem seu próprio comportamento implícito. Então, ao fazer esse, essa modelagem na qual a gente mantém uma parte que é uma parte, digamos, ainda... É, é, de modelo, porém dá uma liberdade tremenda, tanto para saltos quanto para é, volatilidade, o que a gente está fazendo é vivendo num mundo em dimensão muito maior, muito mais próxima do que, por exemplo, os modelos que Machine Learning poderia é, nos dar. Então, é como se a gente tivesse essa variedade maior, esse espaço maior de soluções, e a gente estivesse vivendo num espaço menor, onde a gente ainda está resolvendo nosso problema e está, de alguma forma, é, é, estudando a aproximação nesse espaço de dimensão menor. E, consequentemente, a gente está estudando nessa, digamos, subvariedade, a quanto o problema é mal posto ou quanto ele é bem posto. Então, essa, essa é a perspectiva aí, é uma perspectiva de, de ir para modelos cada vez mais não paramétricos. Viva o mundo não paramétrico, então. Viva o mundo não paramétrico e baseando. <risos> tá bom, se não tiver mais nenhuma pergunta... Eu agradeço mais uma vez ao professor Jorge Zubelli pela sensacional palestra. Tá? Obrigado. Por aceitar o nosso convite. E, vá, e passo de volta a palavra para o Juan. Nosso... Obrigado, professor Zubelli. Obrigado, professor Zubelli, pela excelente palestra.